Whereas in the Bible itself to this day, what is Jesus reported as having said? Says that, think not that I came to destroy the law, rather I came to fulfill it. The law are the laws of the Old Testament. So Jesus, peace be upon him, was following the laws of halal and haram, forbidden what to eat, what not to eat, interest is forbidden, you know, certain dress code, this I can marry, this I cannot marry, all the laws of the Old Testament he was following, of the Torah. But Paul comes in and what does Paul say? He says that the law is dead to me and I am dead to the law. As Christians from this day on, you don't need to follow any law. You can eat whatever you want, you can do whatever you want, all you need to do is believe that Jesus died for your sins. So this is where Paul starts a new uh, angle in Christianity. And that is why the famous book which was written in the 70s by Michael H. Hart in which he puts the 100 best people ever in history or the most influential people in history. He put Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him number one, but he does not put Jesus number two or number three. He puts Paul number two. And Jesus is later down in the list because according to him, the current Christianity is based on what Paul taught, not what Jesus, peace be upon him, taught. So the point is that one needs to be very careful with your dreams, with your visions. Whenever you see something, you think it is from Allah, it is from God. Always double check it with the revelation. Because the revelation we know for sure is from God, right? The Quran is from Allah, Prophet Muhammad's teachings are from Allah. So if you see a vision which contradicts the Quran and the Sunnah, then you should know for sure it is not from Allah. It is from Shaitan. But if that vision is in line with the Quran and Sunnah, then yes, maybe it might be a good news for you, a bashara for you. So a lot of people have been misguided by these visions. Any questions on that? Yes, to be sure. What about uh, the Shaitan? Did he uh, see Allah when he was in the paradise and walked for him? Once again, we have no evidence that any of the creation of Allah has seen him. Even Jibreel a.s. We don't have. Actually, Jibreel a.s. he stops, remember, when he's taking the Prophet to the night journey after a certain point. He says, I cannot go any further. If I go any further, I will burn. Okay, so even Jibreel a.s. has a limit, limitation. So we do not have any evidence uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been seen by anyone. Actually, the verse of the Quran says, La tudrikuhul absa wa huwa yudrikuhul absa. That no vision can encompass him, but he captures all visions. But on the day of judgment for the believers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will expose himself. And this is also from the Quran, you know, uh, what is the verses in Surah al Qiyamah where it says that the believers will, Ila Rabbiha Nazira, they will be seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the people in Jannah. Okay, so what will happen is that once everyone has settled down in their houses, once everyone is enjoying their life in paradise, you have made it to paradise, you have been given your house, your family, the wealth, the property, everything you have. By the way, how much property do you have in paradise? Anyone knows? The, the least person, the one who is the lowest person in paradise, how much property does he have? Huh? Too much. <laughs> Many houses. Too much. <laughs> Many houses. Many houses. Many houses, okay. Ten times the earth. Each? The lowest person. The lowest person in paradise owns ten times the earth. I mean, if you look at human history, how much maximum somebody has ruled? Maybe a continent, you can say, maybe this great leader, he ruled, he was the king of this entire continent. Countries, small areas, you know, and they fight over it, and we, we, we lust over it, and we, we want this influence, and look at what's happening in Syria. And what are the people fighting over? How much power will they have if they gain Syria or Egypt or whatever? These are countries, right? Small countries. What, so, so what if they, if they don't have it? So what? But they are fighting for it. They are, they are fighting tooth and nail in order to keep their power and influence for small areas of land. But in paradise, the lowest person will have ten times the earth. Imagine what the higher levels will have. You know, what, imagine what the highest level will have. SubhanAllah, so the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon. Just the, so, that's the question answer. Because yes. I want to be sure. Yes. What about talking? I, we know that he talked with the Musa yes. Yes. and the... Uh, Yes. There is the dialogue the between him and Adam. And yes. yes, talking has been experienced by many. With his voice? Yes, with his voice. Because he talked to Musa salam, from the bush. He talked to Prophet Muhammad when he went for the night journey. Actually, the last two ayat of Surah Al-Baqarah were revealed to him. You know, 
by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly without and this is in the Quran also there's an ayah where Allah says Allah reveals in different ways you know either uh, through an angel or through directly speaking to the person you know so Allah mentions a few categories how he reveals knowledge to the Anbiya so one of them is directly without a, without a barrier speaking without a barrier to something directly so hearing Allah has, has been experienced by creation some of the creation but seeing him is something which is uh, what we're talking about here. So nobody has seen Allah. So what will happen after everyone settles down in paradise? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask the people, are you happy guys? Do you need anything more? He will say, no. You have given us more than we deserve. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will take off the hijab. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take off the, the barrier, the cover, the light which is covering him. And then people will gaze at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet peace be upon him said that will be the most pleasing thing for the people in paradise. I mean imagine we talk about the, the, the castles in paradise, the rivers of paradise, the women and the men of paradise, the children of paradise, the servants of paradise, all these great things which we get attracted to as human beings. But the greatest pleasure is not all of this. The greatest pleasure will be looking at Allah, seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And who knows, maybe millions of years will pass by and we're watching Allah and feeling this pleasure. Because time is not an issue in paradise. And you don't get tired in paradise. So subhanAllah. And the Prophet peace be upon him said, this will be the salah for the people of Jannah. The prayers, the five, the five daily prayers will not be there in paradise. But how will people pray? When they look at Allah, this will be the direct prayer. I mean, in this world, we try to imagine that Allah is right there and we're watching. Right? That's what the prayer is all about. Five times a day you're imagining Allah is right in front of me. I'm watching. Or at least you try. But in paradise you don't need that anymore because Allah will be right in front of you. But even then the scholars of Islam, they say Allah will not completely expose himself. Part of himself will be exposed to the people of paradise because of the verse La hul absar wa hul absar. No eye, no vision can completely see Allah. Can encompass Allah. But even watching part of Allah or witnessing part of Allah will be a great pleasure to the people of Jannah. May Allah make us amongst them. Any questions? Other questions or comments? So once again, we started off with the point that nobody can imagine Allah correctly. Even if you try, you will fail in that. So though it does not actually exist, this animal, the unicorn does not exist, it is composed of body parts from existing animals and that's why you know uh, you cannot imagine something which you have not witnessed furthermore how can the finite human mind grasp the infinite and that's another question Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not enclosed in a space or a size we are how can we imagine the one who has no limit who you know you cannot imagine within a space or within within a, a land or, or a distance or, or a time you cannot imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within those dimensions then Ibn Qudama he mentions the verse of the Quran in Surah Al-Shura in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in translation of the meaning nothing is similar to him and he is the all hearing the all seeing laysa tamithlihi shay there is nothing like Allah if you try to imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you will not be able to because Allah is not like anything you can imagine Allah is different from your imagination in order for Tawheed or monotheism to be perfect, Allah must be absolutely unique. That is, nothing should be equal or similar to Allah. So if you have in your mind, when you think about Allah, if you think about some creation, then that means you have not got the correct understanding of Allah. You know? Because sometimes when you say certain words, certain images come to your mind. Okay? If I say a mountain, you have an image, some kind of an image of a mountain. But if I say Allah, no image should come to your mind. Because Allah is without anything which you have experienced. If some images are coming to your mind, then that means you need to purify your belief. Having a begotten son, as the Christians claim, would make him similar to his creatures. And that's one of the problems which Islam has with the Christian idea of uh, you know, a begotten son. Because sons and daughters and family members are part of the creation's uh, attributes. Not God's attribute. Allah himself does not need a son or he does not need a family member. Allah does not even have a gender. So for, for somebody to say Allah is the father, you know, then actually you're attributing a gender to God. You're not calling him mother, you're saying father. Well, who gave you that idea that Allah is a father? 
or a mother or has a gender. Now, Allah does not have any gender, so to attribute these kind of things to Allah would be a form of shirk with Allah. Although Christians do not claim that God has a wife, Catholics among them refer to Jesus' mother as the mother of God. So once again, when you say the mother of God, what are you saying? You're saying that the mother of God means the mother of the third part of God, which is Jesus, and the wife of the first part of God, which is the Father. <laughs> it's very confusing actually. When you say the mother of God, when you say Mary is the mother of God, then you're actually saying that God, according to them, who has three different personalities, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, then Mary is the mother of the Son and the wife of the Father, but at the same time, the Father and the Son are one. So it gets very confusing how to explain these concepts when you attribute family members to God. Other religions attribute to God a complete family like wife, brothers, sisters, children, you know, all of these are part of the creation, not Allah. Any questions? Okay, the next thing Ibn Qudama says, the most beautiful names and transcendent attributes belong to him. Once again, he's still praising Allah, trying to explain to us who Allah is. Ibn Qudama refers here to Allah's description of himself in the Quran as having the most beautiful names. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah, there is no God but He, to Him belong the most beautiful names. Allah Himself has said that, and we talked about this when we were talking about the rules, rules which we started with, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whenever we attribute a name or an attribute to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those names are the, the most beautiful names, okay, meaning their meaning is the most beautiful. And the attributes are the most perfect. They have no weakness in them. They have no evil in them. They are all good. Maybe we cannot understand some parts of them, but they are still good and perfect in every sense of the word. It is another aspect of the perfection of Tawheed with regards to Allah that the most beautiful names and transcendent attributes belong to Him alone. He cannot be described by names and attributes which are inferior to those of His creation. Meaning, you know, to say that Allah sleeps, for example. This is an inferior attribute. Sleeping or resting, taking a break, is a weakness. You know, a worker who can work 10 hours continuously is a better worker than the one who has to take naps every 2 to 3 hours. He has to take rest every 2 to 3 hours. This is weakness. The more rests you take, the more weak you are, that shows. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not need a rest. He does not need sleep. Any attribute which will make him like the creation is uh, not uh, to be allowed for Allah. Then he says, the most merciful has settled above the throne. This is part of the verse in Surah Taha. Surah Taha. The most merciful has settled above the throne. And we talked about the throne also when we were talking about the rules. That in Islam we believe, the Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah belief is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you ask where is Allah, then we say what Allah said about Himself, that Allah has established Himself over the throne. That's what the Quran says. Whatever is in the heavens on earth, whatever is between them and under the earth belongs to him. If you speak openly or not, he knows what is secret and what is more hidden. By the way, what does more hidden mean here? Allah knows what is more hidden. What could that mean? Something that we think but we don't uh, do actually. Okay, so part of our thoughts. Uh, yes, part of our right? There's so many things you think of in the day, right? But you don't do all of those things. Yes. Okay. As a human being, I can see and figure out what you are doing through it, through your action, or what you were intending through your action. But I can never know what you are thinking about. And that's where I cannot know about. But Allah knows about. It. Maybe also the unconscious part of us. Yes. Very good. But Allah very good. Very good. Excellent. There are things even we don't know about ourselves. Your things which are in your subconscious. You know, for example, your dreams, most of our dreams come from that subconscious part of our mind. Or our, what you call, reflex actions happen from that part. Even if you're not trying to do it, you will automatically do it because it's part of the uh, subconscious mind. So, Allah knows even that part. What about the future thoughts which we have not thought about yet? Do you know what you will be thinking about tomorrow? At this time? And you don't know, right? You go, you think as you go. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already knows what you will be even thinking about tomorrow or in the future. 
So these are areas where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even knows what is even more in him. The author uses these verses from Surah Taha as an example in order to reiterate his statement concerning Allah's names and attributes being the most beautiful and transcendent. The name of Rahman, we have discussed this before, is most beautiful, so much so that it belongs to Allah alone, even in the indefinite form, Rahman. Remember we said there are some names which if you remove the Al part, you can call those names to the other people. Okay, like Rahim is one of Allah's names. Al Rahim, the most merciful one, but you can say somebody else is Rahim also without adding the Al part. But the name Ar Rahman, even in the indefinite form, you cannot say it to another person. It is so high and so beautiful and so transcendent that even in the indefinite form cannot be given to somebody. So you cannot call any person Rahman. Oh, Mr. Rahman, come here. Do not say that. Okay, because it is the attribute of Allah and it's unique for him. Furthermore, the attribute of Rahma, which is mercy, associated with this name is transcendent. Meaning you cannot, nobody can compete with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. The attribute of mercy is transcendent. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone has it. And whatever mercy we have on earth is because of the one part which Allah has put on earth. Remember the hadith where the Prophet peace be upon him said Allah has hundred parts of mercy, only one of them he's put on the earth. So all the mercy which we show towards each other, the animals show towards, you know, the mother um, animal shows towards the baby animal, that is from Allah's Rahmah. And 99 parts have been left for the Akhirah, the Day of Judgment. Allah will be so merciful on the Day of Judgment because you will pardon so many people. Allah is further described as being above and beyond all of His creation. Since the throne is the highest created entity, Allah's being above it is the affirmation of His being above all of His creation. So once again, the question, is Allah around us? Is Allah below us? Is Allah in us? You know, when you talk about these questions, what is the answer from the Quran and the Sunnah? Allah is above us. Allah is above us. And above does not mean, you know, above in this direction. Because direction does not apply to Allah subhanahu Above means above and beyond. Meaning he's outside the realm of the world and everything is under his throne. Everything is under the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the throne according to some scholars was the first thing Allah created. First thing Allah created was his own throne. Do you know how, how heavy the throne of Allah is? How heavy the throne of Allah is. Do we know the weight of Allah's throne? Huh? No. It is heavier for sure than everything He has created. Right? We know that. Allah's throne is heavier than everything He has created because it is above and beyond the rest of His creation. To give you a glimpse of how heavy the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, um, do you know the weight of the hellfire? Hellfire is a place and it will it has a weight to it, right? And on the day of judgment, hellfire will be dragged towards the people. And how many angels will be carrying the hellfire? You know? Nineteen. Nineteen are above the hellfire. How many are carrying the hellfire on the day of judgment Eight. so that people can see it? Huh? Eight. 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 Eight angels. So the throne is uh, carried by eight. Yes, the throne is carried by eight, but those those eight are much much stronger than any any angel you can think of. But to tell you, the hellfire uh, it is described in the hadith that the Prophet peace be upon him said that the hellfire will be dragged on the day of judgment, and it has seventy thousand chains. No, seventy thousand chains or reins, whatever you can call it, but which are being pulled. And on each one of those reigns, there are 70,000 angels. Wow. 70,000 chains and 70,000 uh, angels for each one of them. 70,000 times 70,000. How much is that? <laughs> Mathematics gurus who are math gurus here. 70,000 times 70,000. To be 49 to power Forty nine million or four hundred nine million. <laughs> Something like that. Which is actually in the billions. Forty nine billion. It comes comes in the billion. Can you imagine those number of angels? Just imagine six billion human beings carrying something. We are how many? Six, seven billion on earth? 
7 billion human beings carrying sun. Imagine not, not human beings, but 7 billion angels who are very strong carrying sun. Then multiply that with you know, 49 billion angels. 